Good afternoon. Uh, thank you all for joining us for our What's Next for Data Centers Across Asia Pacific webinar. I'm Todd Olson, head of Cushman & Wakefield's Asia Pacific Data Center Practice Group. I'm based in Tokyo and I'll be moderating our session today. Data centers have become a very established asset class in a vibrant sector and with tremendous growth continued to be projected over the years to come. I think when I speak for all of us on the webinar, we're all looking to keep up on market activity across the region to try to forecast and understand what future trends are going to be affecting the market as we move forward. And generally just trying to get more involvement in this sector in whatever area we're active in ourselves. We really hope that today's webinar will help facilitate a discussion, questions, ideas in these areas, and everyone will find it of, of value and, and interest. Now I'd like to move ahead and introduce my colleagues that will be presenting during the session today. First is Kevin. We're very happy to have him from San Jose. Uh, he leads our Global uh, Data Center Insights Group, and he'll be talking about our global and regional industry trends. He'll be followed by Hideaki, who leads our Business Development Services team in Japan and is part of our Asia Pacific research team. He'll be presenting some highlights and, and recently uh, released insights from our Data Center Update Asia Pacific report. Um, and that's focused on four of the gateway markets across the region. Summer will then join us to give some insights into the vast greater China market and be joined by Kevin as they talk about some of the emerging secondary markets across the region. Um, and then at the end, we'll leave ample time for questions and answers. Um, we'd ask all of you to feel free during the session at any time uh, to input any questions and we'll try to get to as many of them as we can at the end of the session. You should see a question mark icon in the top right hand uh, side of your screen um, and please feel free to submit them as I said. With that, I'd like to go ahead and hand over to Kevin. Well, thank you so much, Todd, and thanks for having me tonight, um, at least tonight in the US for me. We're going to go over some of the key industry trends that are that are affecting data centers and why data centers are growing by leaps and bounds every year. We've seen huge M&A across the world, new companies getting created all the time, and a lot of private equity and pension fund capital coming in, 20 to 30 billion dollars a year in fact. So what are what is driving a lot of this? Well, a lot of this is being driven by major cloud services. Well, what do we mean by major cloud services? You see some names on the right hand side of your screen there. AWS, Amazon Web Services, Microsoft Azure, Google Cloud. Those are the three largest. We are we are all familiar with those companies, but they're making a lot of their profit off of these services now an increasing amount so. We've also combined here some of the large services based in mainland China, Alibaba, Tencent, Huawei, and Kingsoft. These are certainly very different companies, but we've combined them here to show the, the level that they have to rise to meet the other three. And they are growing by leaps and bounds as well, but they have a coming from a much lower base. And you see some very large percentages there. Those are, those are projected by our partner structure research and they're figuring that those are going to be pretty realistic as more organizations take on cloud services. And why are they doing that? Well, the events of the past year, the pandemic and related complications when people were sent home, those ex that accelerated many different trends. In other words, large companies were already on their way to changing their IT portfolios, moving into the cloud, maybe ex changing to a multi-cloud approach or a hybrid structure, which is now very popular for cost savings. But when people were sent home, they were forced to do it. And cloud services breaked in the profit. You see some Q1 uh, highlights there. AWS revenue up a ton, Azure up a ton, Google Cloud up a ton. And that's been that way for the past two years. And it will likely continue to be that way because large corporations and governments alike are moving onto these services. And these services in turn are working in the community. Several of them are working on skilling programs. In other words, training local engineers to use more of these products, thus bringing them into the fold, thus making them lifelong converts. 
And so these services will continue to drive the industry. Now, we talked about some of the capital coming into the sector and there are a few very recent highlights here. GA Capital, $1.3 billion has been put into a fund between among them, Abu Dhabi Investment Authority and many others, and they'll be building across greater China, primary, secondary, tertiary markets. One Asia, similarly, looking to build across the country. They had a big investment from APG, which is a very large Dutch pension fund, and that they commingled a bunch of other Dutch pension fund capital in order to do that. And they're looking beyond China, in fact. They're looking to Japan, Korea, Thailand. And Princeton Digital Group, uh, they're going to come up a couple times throughout this. They added another $230 million, and they're looking in secondary and tertiary markets across China too, another 300 megawatts of development. Now, not to be outdone, you're seeing a lot of development in India, and we're only going to touch slightly on India in this particular webinar. We'll probably have one coming up soon, hint, hint, on the, the Indian market. But Adani and Edge Connects have now partnered to construct a gigawatt of new data centers over the next decade in both primary and secondary markets across India. Now, this is particularly interesting because Adani was rumored to be uh, working on a partnership with Digital Realty, the global REIT. Digital went away, Edge Connects came in, and this is going to be a big investment and a big portfolio uh, by the end of it. Not to be outdone, Iron Mountain, they're a global company. They're a relatively new entrant into data centers. They're adding another $150 million into a joint venture with WebWorks. Same sort of thing, primary, secondary markets across India. India will be growing by a ton. Now, how easy is it to build a global portfolio? Very hard. How is it? E how easy is it to build across Asia? Very, very difficult, as a matter of fact. And this chart is here. We're not going to go too deep into this, but this chart is here to show how difficult it is. There are a lot of gaps on that chart. Really, the best place to cross the most geographical markets are the telecoms. And this is similar to a lot of data center markets in their infancy, where the telecoms started off and then the specialized companies come in afterwards. So you see NTT and China Telecom are probably in the most the largest number of markets, but we have a lot of new entrants are trying to go across the continent. Now, we're talking billions of people. We're talking a ton of different local regulations, land acquisition difficulties, power acquisition difficulties. This is going to take a lot of work, but as the next few years go on, we're going to start to see this chart getting filled in. Data center operators around the world are focused on scalability. Their clients are demanding it. They're expecting compute at the edge, in other words, close to the user, and they're going to expect larger and larger scale as time goes on. Now, there's always capital leaving the region and going to other regions. And here are a few recent highlights of this year. So Maple Tree out of Singapore, big data center campus in Richmond, Virginia, leased the Bank of America, spent a couple hundred million on that. And I hear whispers and rumors of possible fur further acquisitions. Large development in Northern Virginia. This is a, a new entrant to the space, TA Realty, very large industrial player backed by Mitsubishi Estate. Mitsubishi is backing this to the tune of $1.8 billion. It's going to be a very large campus in the world's largest data center market, and they're going to be building across several buildings, um, probably a couple hundred megawatts when all said and done. Also, Ascendus, also out of Singapore, they just acquired a very large pan-European portfolio from Digital Realty. It's at the tune of $680 million. That was involving several primary markets throughout Europe, but also a couple secondary markets. Good tenancy throughout, very strong assets, and that gave them a foothold going into that market. And now I will pass on to Hideaki. He will tell you about some of the primary markets throughout the region. Right, thank you, Kevin. So now I'd like to walk through major data center markets in Asia Pacific and their growth projections. Could you go to next? Yeah, thank you. Uh, but before we actually discuss individual markets, let's take a look at the prospects for 5G technologies, which will be very important for us to understand data center demand, particularly in this Asia Pacific region. Talk, uh, today, we are uh, our mobile networks are predominantly covered by 4G, and the expansion of 
4G brought us about like a significant communication improvement, also alongside with a rapid adoption of smartphone. With a nearly half of the world population now owning a smartphone, and this widespread technology has made our communication speed incredibly fast and efficient. Um, we now can use our smartphone to make video calls, conference call, and join webinar, and share information immediately almost anywhere in the world. And just to remind ourselves, this has all happened just a little over a decade. And now what's next is a 5G, 5G technology that's being rapidly invested in a, as a new mobile network. But hang on, why 5G so matters? Why it's so important for us? Well, that's because 5G traffic capacity is 100 times more, more than 4G and latency is 10 times lower than 4G. Connection density is 10 times more efficient. And the last thing is uh, network slicing. Um, 5G can slice network for different levels of connectivity, such as for connected cars and video, count, video streaming at the same time. And again, 4G cannot do that. So 5G network will trigger the next phase of our, of our future, bringing new technologies into life. Internet of Things, IoT, virtual reality, augmented reality, simultaneous sports broadcasting and streaming, and connected cars, autonomous cars, and virtual surgery, and multi-access edge computing, so on and so forth. And according to Ericsson's estimates, 5G is expected to account about 30% of the total mobile subscription in 2024, and it will reach to 44% in 2026. So it's a very likely scenario that the rate of technological innovation we will experience, experience in coming years will not exactly the same past 10 years that 4G has brought us, but much, uh, much faster, say half the time we will see. And now uh, if you look at the graph on the right hand side, more than 65% of this 5G growth is expected to come from this Asia Pacific region. In other words, much of the information traffic from 5G adoption will come from this region. This also means significant amount of data center demand will continue to flow into this region. Right, next slide please. Now let's turn to a uh, major data center market in Asia Pacific. We, CNW, Kuchman Wakefield, analyze the data center markets across the globe and looking at various market drivers and identify the outlook for major and emerging markets. And in our ranking, the top four major Asian markets are Sydney, Singapore, Hong Kong, and Tokyo. The map you're currently looking at shows a submarine cable running throughout the region. It's a complex network, as you can see, and submarine cables serve as a very important communication infrastructure connecting uh, country to country and continents to continent with a fiber cable. So our communication infra is really supported by these actual fiber lines in addition to satellite networks and others. As you can see from there, many submarine cables have already been landed onto those markets ranked in the top four. Okay, let's move on to Sydney market. Right, Sydney continues to maintain impressive pace in data center space with the several government agency joining uh, major data cloud services as top level tenancy for local operators. And local uh, clients also continue to demand greater sophistication in their IT strategies. And several clients also looking for pure hybrid frameworks using multiple major cloud services. And large space remains still in very highly demand with a several additional projects currently underway, uh, including 36 mega, megawatt facility by uh, DCI, and that will be, com will be com completed by end of 2022. And Air Trunk as well, recently completed the first phase of the campus with the plans for 110 megawatts at a full completion. So currently overall in Sydney, total 79 megawatt under, megawatts under construction. Microsoft also acquired three development sites in the suburbs of Seven Hills, um, Blacktown and Lake, Lane Cove to enhance their product offering. And major cloud services remain bullish on Sydney market. Um, Amazon adding further services and OVH adding a second location. The investment market is also active and Charter Hall uh, recently acquired Sydney office and data center tower in sale and leaseback opportunity with a Testra. And Tesla will stay as a tenant until 2030, but the site itself is also looking really attractive at the future development site afterwards. 
Lambda availability is still very high for data center development, particularly throughout the greater Western Sydney suburbs, where many of the current activities are currently taking place. Um, although many other regional destinations or com competing markets like uh, Tokyo, Singapore and Hong Kong have struggled with power availability or uh, some cases geopolitical concerns, the ability of Sydney to simply secure scalable land and power makes the city as a really still attractive market for continued growth. And secondary market and tertiary markets across the country have also continued their positive momentum, which will increase regional connectivity. And recently announced Project Coete will create three new data centers in Perth, Darwin and Dampier. And with a 8,000 kilometer submarine cable that will link these uh, markets, to Indonesia, Singapore and Malaysia. And this additional capability will definitely provide this uh, area with a new level of high speed access. So overall, um, a continued positive outlook for the reminder of 2021 and throughout the next year for Sydney. OK, let's move on to Singapore now. Right. And in Singapore, there are currently around 60 data centers and additional phases with 173 megawatts are in pipeline and Sin uh, sorry, uh, Singapore enjoys its location advantage as a Southeast Asia regional hub and continued digital ecosystem development as well, uh, where major cloud services including Google, Oracle and Alibaba differentiating their service offerings by simply adding new products and uh, strengthening cloud availability. The combination of low risk of natural disaster and political stability and robust power grid it also helps Singapore to be a preferred destination for those global data center players. The map uh, really proves how strongly connected the country is in, in terms of submarine cable. So it's really truly a leading data center market in Asia. Right. However, there's one thing I have to mention. Uh, there has been a more for new development construction in place at the moment. And um, the government is not approving the new development projects, uh, which poses some uncertainties for future DC um, digital ecosystem developments. The main reason for this moratorium is um, actually sustainability agenda. According to the Ministry of Trade and Industry, data center in Singapore accounted for around like a 7% equivalent of the total national electricity consumption in 2020, which is very, very high and raises the question of this environmental sustainability. And um, this is not only uh, because of typical high electricity consumption by data center facilities, but also tropical climate plus already expensive local power costs as a sort of country specific factors. So the government is currently evaluating the balance between business needs and environmental sustainability. Expectation is the moratorium will be lifted by 2022, but it's too it's still too early to speculate. We will see. And so because of this, this situation, currently existing facilities enjoy robust tenancy demand with increased rents. Right. And also there are several uh, encouraging sustainability initiatives going on. Keteo Data Center is developing the concept of floating data center on the sea and Digital Reality recently launched a sustainable, sustainable uh, data center with a new cooling system to improve water use efficiency and turbine generators instead of having diesel engines. Um, with that development pulse or monitorium urging data center players to accelerate their sustainability agenda which will actually ultimately help Singapore to keep its position as one of the leading, top leading Asia data center markets. So our view for Singapore is actually a shake up. Right, uh, next market is Hong Kong. So Hong Kong has seen several challenges last few years, but none of those challenges stop growth of data, uh, growth of uh, Hong Kong data center markets. And there have been newly released development sites with a data center planning permission in Hong Kong that came out with an impressive pricing with a maple tree winning the site early this year. The firm plans to construct their first local project with a first phase completion by 2023 and establish the operators uh, CITIC, Equinix and Sai Vision are continuing on their uh, new development as well. And mainland operator GDS is underway on an initial phase project project. Global Switch and Air Trunk both completed large projects in recent months, and Air, Air Trunk is obviously pursuing uh, market entry across major regional cities. And Global Switch 
uh, completed a large 58 megawatt additional phase to their data center in uh, Chongquan Ore uh, with a low 1.3 PUE available across the facility. And their data center now offers over 100 megawatt of power to clients and also situated close to the cable landing station. Um, when we talk about cable, recent news say that Facebook and Google are dropping the uh, Hong Kong Los Angeles submarine cable. However, that there will be further connectivity to soon to link Hong Kong to other regional locations. Uh, the Asia direct cable is scheduled to go live by end of 2022 with uh, over 9,000 uh, 9, kilometer network. And this cable will link Hong Kong to Japan, Philippines, mainland China, Vietnam, Thailand, and Singapore. Also, uh, very similar, uh, Southeast Asia Japan Cable 2 will be coming online next year. And that will link Hong Kong to Korea, Japan, mainland China, Taiwan, Vietnam, and Thailand. And furthermore, the China Mobiles, mobiles um, Hainan to Hong Kong Express Cable will link to Hong Kong to Uncham and Zhuhai with operating starting this year. Um, also, several data center companies, companies are having their official headquarters in Hong Kong. In order to leverage Hong Kong's local strong financial power and the flexibility of listing on the Hong Kong exchange. GDS, for example, first listed on US Nasdaq, recently completed a secondary listing on the Hong Kong exchange. That provides scalable capital for their future expansion. And Turbidite was recently launched, uh, which is supported by New World Development. And Turbidite is taking an interesting entry to Guam for their first data center. And the island is uh, that Guam Island is actually gaining increased data center importance with the recently announced of two new cross Pacific undersea cable that will connect Guam to Asia and North America. Okay, next one is my last slide. And that is about Tokyo, right? In Greater Tokyo, currently 79 megawatt under construction. Tokyo Steel is probably the largest market size in Asia Pacific, and predominantly led by telecom companies and large data center operators. The market is still rapidly growing into the hyperscale hub throughout East Asia. For example, Coldo and Equinix completed construction on new campuses late 2020. And and Equinix now working on their second phase with this because they're seeing uh, strong leasing and advanced commitments from the local clients. We are also seeing a remarkable hyperscale cluster in, in the area. The upcoming uh, Air Trunk campus launching its first phase before year end. And many of the clients are looking to this growing in the area to use their low, uh, national and regional entry point. Right? Then the investment market also active. AXA Investment Management acquired SoftBank Data Center for 22 billion Japanese yen. This strong pricing indicates really the desire for data center assets in Tokyo with top level tenancy and transaction volume will remain, uh, is expected to remain strong in coming years um, because we are seeing increasing number of large funds now having data center sector as part of their uh, global strategy. So Tokyo has enjoyed continued growth in past months and also looks set for another great year. Now I'm passing to Summer and Kevin who will talk about growing secondary market. Thank you. Okay, um, thank you very much Hideaki. This is Summer from Cushman and Wakefield Beijing office. So now um, I'm gonna walk you through the mainland China market with um, two high level trends because the country is so large. Um, one thing is to see how this sector is developing with the support from capital markets. And the other thing, uh, the other thing is um, what are the new initiatives that we are seeing in terms of data center sustainability? So these are the two trends we are seeing. Um, the COVID-19 pandemic has um, somehow shifted the investors attention from traditional commercial um, properties to tech-driven real estate opportunities. For example, um, Kipo uh, launched its second effort, KDC uh, Founder 2, with a first close of more than 500 million US dollars from various institutional um, investors by the end of last year. 
And we see that most investors' first preference in China market is usually tier one cities like Beijing and Shanghai, then followed by surrounding satellite cities due to spillover effect. And another example is Princeton Digital Group. Having recently completed a 42 megawatts data center campus in Shanghai, um, PDG has secured 230 million US dollars in debt financing from China Merchants Bank and with plans for more data centers in the coming months. Its new facilities in Shanghai is now completely contracted to a single tenant. And it's also important to note that the data center market um, is expected to benefit from the innovation of capital markets in China, especially when the first batch of nine public REITs just got approved three days ago, um, aiming to finance the country's next phase of development through digital infrastructures, including 5G and data centers. Now, let's go to the next slide. Um, another observation that we have in the first quarter of 2021 is the trend of um, sustainability of data center, especially when China aims to have greenhouse gas emission peak before 2030 and achieve carbon neutrality before 2060. Increasingly, data centers have um, come under intense scrutiny from environmental groups because of their significant contribution to the carbon emissions. On one hand, um, we noticed that the Chinese government set stricter PUE requirement um, in tier one cities in particular. And on the other hand, we also observe there are um, more sustainability initiatives and new technologies in this data center sector. Um, for example, Beijing Highlander I, uh, unveiled uh, China's first underwater data center project in Zhuhai uh, in the first quarter this year. And it plans to carry out and build more underwater data center projects over the next five years across the greater China region. And another example is China Ya'an um, Big Data Industrial Park, who received two certifications in the first quarter this year and become the first certified national carbon neutral um, green data center in China. So um, we see that market players are also take actions to contribute to the sustainability of data center. Um, one good example comes from GDS, who just announced that the new renewable energy accounted for 20% uh, of its total energy consumption in 2020. It also plans to issue its first ESG report and reveals its ambition to set carbon neutral targets, um, including time frame and roadmap in the first quarter um, this year. So, okay, thanks everyone. I think now uh, I'll pass it to Kevin. Thanks again, Summer, much appreciated. So speaking of some of the other secondary markets across the continent, Osaka is rapidly developing, and it has been for the last couple of years, and you see a couple of the players that are listed on the screen. Digital Realty is a joint venture throughout Japan with Mitsubishi Corp for large campus development. They're doing that in Tokyo, and they're also doing this in Osaka. NTT also is adding their seventh, that's right, seventh data center in the market. They're very well established, but they're still adding new stock. And that a lot of the development now is similar to, as Hideaki mentioned, in Inzai, just outside of Tokyo proper. You're seeing this in Ibaraki, just outside of Osaka proper as well. A little more centrally located in town, Equinix already has one data center already operational, but they also have a hyperscale joint venture, just as digital does. Their partnership is with GIC, 
and they're building several large hyperscale centers across the world, including here in Osaka. And there's another new player that's entering the market, and this is the first data center build for them. ESR Cayman, that's a very large industrial player that we're probably all very familiar with across the continent. They just acquired a new site uh, out in the close, kind of close to the harbor and the terminals there. They're looking to build an eventual 78 megawatts, so rehabbing an existing site, adding on to it and uh, building a very large facility locally. You see some logos on the right side of this slide. All the major cloud players are already involved in the market, and we're going to see this market scale considerably, probably doubling in size over the next couple of years. Jakarta, this is, this is a favorite topic to talk about lately. I think Indonesia as a whole, you, if you would ask me probably two or three years ago what the most underserved data center market in the world is, I would have probably said Indonesia 1 and Mexico 2. Both those countries are now red hot with data center development. Why is this? Well, Alibaba was the first cloud, major cloud service into the market, and you see a bunch of other logos up there now. The rest of them have followed. AWS is about to go live. The others already have. And they're taking a lot of capacity from operators that you see on the right side of the screen. So you see a couple of the usual telecoms that, that we see in a lot of other countries. Capital is also uh, building in, in Indonesia as well. DCI is local. Space DC, Singapore based, but Indonesia centric. And Princeton Digital, who we've talked about already, they're actually the first company to really build or at least start to build a pan Indonesia portfolio. So they're moving out into some of the other cities and, and going to the edge in Indonesia. The interesting thing being that the internet penetration across the country is only at 75%. So there's still, by my calculation, that sounds like 70 or 80 million more people who need to get online. And this is despite the success of so many apps across Indonesia. We saw recently, in fact, it was, I think it was this week, right? Gojek, Tokopedia are merging together. Grab is a very popular app across the country. It's a very app-centric country, and there was sort of a gap there where internet usage was straight to mobile. And so that's a, a becoming a very sophisticated market as well. Hideaki mentioned also a couple new cables that are coming along, the Bifrost and Echo cables, and those are being funded by the Googles and Facebooks of the world. They're connecting Jakarta, but they're also connecting Jakarta right to Singapore. So as Singapore works through their moratorium, workloads are now starting to orbit toward Jakarta. A lot cheaper to build, and the capacity is still available. Those, both those cables then connect to Guam, as you've already heard, but then also connect to the United States. So these are major, major changes, making Jakarta a very important market. Another note here, too, is that there are certain secondary markets across the continent that are rapidly going to become primary, these two that we've already just mentioned, but also Mumbai and India, certainly many projects underway there. It'll grow into a primary market very quickly. And also Seoul, we, which we haven't touched on quite yet, that's essentially a primary market already in terms of overall size, but not in terms of international operators. And so I think a lot of folks tend to view that as a secondary market when truly it's a primary market. A couple other regional notes. Um, we mentioned Jakarta being on the winning end of some of the moratorium in Singapore. Well, that's not to say that Kuala Lumpur isn't either. KL, of course, uh, has a few local operators you already see there, both international and local. Alibaba is, the, is there already, and other cloud players are coming in shortly. Again, this is a market that could stand to benefit from an ecosystem that's already existed in small time, but has the ability to grow. Now, we talked again about the power needs of Singapore. The Energy Market Authority, there's a, an RFP due in about a week and a half, two weeks. They're looking for Malaysia power providers to provide 100 megawatts for Singapore. And that can come in a variety of forms. So if any of you are interested in bidding, I suggest get your bids in. Vietnam as a market too, uh, we get a lot of questions about that. That's a market with about 70% internet penetration. Uh, there is a power shortage there. They're working on some power agreements from obtaining power from Laos and China, mostly hydro or wind. But really, you're looking at less than 30 megawatts, by my count at least, of capacity across the country. 
So I might argue now that now that these other markets are starting to grow and grow quickly, Vietnam might very well be the most undata centered place in the world now. So we'll have to see how that grows in coming years. And passing it back to uh, Todd, I believe. Great, thank you, Kevin. Thanks, everyone. Um, we've had a couple questions coming in. I'd just like to remind everyone um, there should be a question mark icon up in the top right hand corner of your screen and feel free to submit uh, any questions that you have as we're uh, going through some that have come in. Um, I'd read out to the panel. Um, the first question uh, gets back to what I think Kevin touched on a little bit on what are the key investment trends and opportunities in the region today? And maybe um, Summer, uh, you had talked a little bit around that. Maybe we could start with you and and go around the group. Um, OK, um, well, maybe I can share something about uh, China market. Um, um, we, we see uh, many uh, fund clients, especially those investors with real estate background. Um, they prefer to hold the property asset in top tier cities in China, um, where cloud services providers, internet companies, and application developers have strong demand for data center infrastructures. Um, I think a good example is Capital Land. Um, they just acquired its first hyperscale data center campus in Shanghai last month for RMB 3.66 billion. Um, but you know, actually the deal sourcing is never easy in tier one cities such as Shenzhen, where the scarcity of industry land is a challenge. So one of the alternative way that we, uh, we see some investors are taking is to acquire underperformed existing industrial buildings and then convert them into data center use. Um, otherwise, um, they can only choose to seek investment opportunities in those lower tier cities. So yeah, I, I hope those um, insights are in, uh, would, would be helpful for you. Yeah, thank you. Thanks, Summer. Um, Kevin, maybe a hand to you and just add, you know, I get a lot of inquiries, you know, kind of in Tokyo and across the region from some of the larger investors and institutional investors, especially raising new funds. Um, you know, data center is um, the primary focus, or at least including data center, and questions about how to place, you know, a larger amount of money um, rather than maybe one-off asset deals. Um, how do you see that as opportunity in the region, and, and maybe compared to, you know, other regions, for example? Sure, I think that's a that's a very tricky question for a lot of funds because there's so much impetus to get into the space and they see the growth potential. But I think the issue is that whereas across the uh, US, for example, or even some parts of Western Europe, these areas have older data center portfolios. We see assets that were built in the 90s, the 2000s, what have you. And some of these are corporate data centers. Some of these are built by telecoms. Across Asia, outside of maybe Japan, maybe Singapore, these assets don't really exist, these older operational assets. In order to get the return you want, I think in a lot of cases there has to be some acceptance of development risk. So either backing an operator uh, as in a minority or a possibly a majority position, or going directly into development with an operational partner. And I think that's going to be the story going forward because none of us are going to get off our phones and none of us are going to stop using the internet. And so as, as this need keeps growing and growing, there's going to need to be probably several hundred times the capacity we have now in the coming years. So the development that looks risky at the moment, may, might it take a little longer to lease up in a secondary or tertiary market? Yes, but your return is going to be considerably more than trying to bid on the handful of operational assets across the region. Kevin, maybe just as a follow up, I, I know you've shown logo on some of your slides and we know that the hyperscale, uh, you know, players are, are very active in their different, you know, phases in their expansion throughout the region, but obviously control big portfolios, whether it be within single countries and across the region. Um, you know, that could be a source of 
you know, a pretty large chunk. What what are those hyperscalers thinking right now about holding that on balance sheet, off balance sheet? You know, I've heard a little bit different from different groups. Are you seeing anything trend or or one way that those groups are looking at their portfolios? Well, I think it's a mixed bag depending on the area of the world. So across the their home market in the U.S., their preference is to build rather than lease. Now, what ends up happening is they end up signing uh, very large contracts with corporations or government entities, and they end up having to lease a lot of capacity to meet those requirements because their large campuses sometimes are not ready at the time of the uh, the move from for those entities. So I think it's it's sort of a mix because as they move across the world and add on additional regions, to this point, there's been most more leasing rather than building. But I think going forward, as they become more comfortable and attract more clients and require more scale, then it becomes more cost effective if they can plan accordingly and then build campuses. So I think going forward, we'll see more of a mixed approach across the world in several markets, some leasing, but also some development but overall, just a general need for more and more capacity as they fight for market share. Thanks. Um, you know, Hideaki, I think you threw out an example of a recent acquisition, you know, of a data center in Tokyo, uh, looking at growth in that sector moving forward. How do you see that? You know, I think sale leaseback, for example, is is one very sought after um, opportunity in this asset class as in others. How do you see that from the stock or availability side of those types of opportunities moving forward? Right, sure. So in Japanese data center market investment, right, investment market. So let me let me say there are two kinds of investment opportunities. Probably one is for what greenfield development, and the other one is stabilized assets. And those that stabilized assets category is actually predominantly about sale and lease back opportunities. And um, it's great to see um, number of investors purchasing or developing uh, data center investment at the moment. However, uh, when you actually see some of the um, assets of uh, sale and lease back deals, um, those data center facilities were actually built back to 1980 or 1990. So when we didn't really have much advancement on the technology for data center space. So when we come across those uh, sale on lease back type of investment opportunity, we have to be really careful and identify the motivation of the seller in offloading the assets from, the, from their balance sheet. For example, um, do, do they really want to work with real estate investors? as a strategic partner or do they simply want to offload their assets from the balance sheet because those facilities are getting too old. So uh, data center as a sector has a really, really good theme for growth, but there are lots of nuances there. Then we have to be really careful and be selective on the deal picking. Thank you, uh, Hideaki. Um, I think we could talk about this a lot longer, but we might better move on to a, a couple other questions that have come in. I'm going to group a couple of them together, and it's around you know one of the points that I know Summer um, and Hideaki have touched on, and that's sustainability. Uh, and the question is, um, you know, what are the trends and impact that you see that sustainability or renewable energy will have upon the sector in Asia Pacific? And maybe I just add, you know, we see a lot of times a lot of these trends come from North America or Europe, you know, into the region. Uh, Kevin, as well as if you have any insights of you know, what these groups are looking at and how, how that may translate into future you know, thinking for investors and owners of you know, data centers, as well as the investors in the call. Um, maybe we could start with you, Kevin, if you have any thoughts. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, this is going to be the driving force for the next couple decades, really. I think a lot of the the hyperscalers that we've talked about have made carbon neutral pledges, and so they're intending to be either carbon neutral or even uh, fully carbon reductive in the case of Microsoft by twenty certain dates, 2030, 2040, 2050, what have you. 
And so as these companies demand this, these are the largest users of capacity and several other large multinationals are trying to do the same. So in turn, the industry has to respond. Now, regionally, the issue is that a lot of power is not generated through renewables. And I think that's going to be part of the the concern going forward, right? How do we how do we source in a lot of these local markets, the wind, the solar, and especially hydro, if at all possible, to help power data centers? When you're talking about a hundred megawatt data center, that one building takes as much power as a large city. If you're thinking about a hundred thousand, hundred fifty thousand people, that would be the equivalent. And so. These are these are going to be increasingly under scrutiny as the years come on, and as such, the uh, the industry as a whole has to respond. And I think there are a bunch of efficiency drives around air cooling, around uh, liquid cooling inside the data center, better design. There, there's any number of things you can do to help. And so the uh, as long as long as you build intelligently and then scale accordingly, then that's how it's uh, how things will probably develop. Great insights. Um, you know, Summer, I know you had mentioned, um, you know, in your presentation, some greater China examples. Do you see these just as, you know, representative of change that's going to come for more developers and more of the market or kind of a one off? Or how do you see that that trend or any more, a little bit more detail and insights for greater? Um, thank you. Yeah, um, as I just mentioned a lot on the sustainability issue in my previous slide, um, China has set a very specific goal on the carbon emission reduction. So uh, this is a national strategy that um, we have to respond for um, various industries, not just the data center. And it's good to see that now there's more and more market players making their sustainability commitment in the public disclosure by means of ESG report or the other um, disclosures, um, as well as their efforts, yes, um, to explore the technical frontier for greener and uh, more energy efficient data centers. So I think forward, forward looking, um, uh, data center with uh, resilience design and uh, uh, more sustainability uh, features could uh, keep more competitive edge in the um, in the market. Yeah, thank you. Okay, great. Um, Hideaki, I don't want to leave you out. Uh, anything maybe North Asia sure. or, or Japan focused that you'd like to add? Sure. So sustainability. So inter importance of sustainability has incre increased a lot and will uh, will grow far more. Um, I talk about Singapore as an example, and the country is now having the moratorium for the new development construction. That is uh, predominantly because of the sustainability agenda of Singapore. And major Asia Pacific market we went through today. Also, the common issue of those market is really access to power. And this is a becoming more of, of access to sustainable sustainable power. So when we look at the investment market, the currently uh, dry powder of those investors is really significant, and we are seeing increasing number of investors now having data centers as a part of their strategy. But highly likely, we are going to see more from equity investors and bank, and they will start to scrutinize sustainability element of those investors data center uh, strategy. So highly likely we will see the sustainability coming up much, much higher priority of the investment strategy. Thank you. Um, we're getting a lot of questions uh, around emerging markets. Uh, what are hot spots and why kind of a little bit uh, asking for more detail, maybe a little bit further down the line from some of the secondary markets. Um, and uh, specifically, um, you know, Kevin, I think you hinted at this earlier. You know, I think India itself is such a big opportunity. Uh, we've decided that, you know, we're going to try to create a separate webinar coming up just to deal with that in enough depth. And we have a, a number of questions, but maybe as we're talking about you know, emerging markets, um, just a, a touch on anything on India, um, just as a, 
you know, a primer for that that separate podcast or webinar would be great. Oh, absolutely. And I, I think for starters, or at least over the past few years, the question about India was always, how can you obtain reliable power? And I think that's what paused a lot of international operators from moving in. And it turns out that a lot of the companies that have power arms uh, are now joining into the data center development part. So they are, they're already used to sourcing power. And so that's going to be very helpful. I think also, too, there's this latent demand, again, as a, the country continues to move mo millions of people online every year, that there's there's very little local uh, presence in anything lower than a, a top tier city. And so you have IT hubs such as Bangalore, Hyderabad, Chennai that that are going to have very large data center markets over the next three to five years. This is the local demand, both in terms of IT, but also in terms of just general population and needing that power. Mumbai will likely be the primary hub, as we've already discussed. It is the largest business hub in country, but also throughout uh, Delhi, Noida, that area, and um, close, many coastal locations that have access to undersea cables. Those will all become growth markets, and so we're expecting continued capital to flow throughout the country and uh, and building throughout. Thanks, Kim. Another question we had was. Uh... Um, you know, the secondary markets, uh, the question specifically is, is access and difficulty in access to the power companies one of the reasons that these are secondary and haven't become primary markets? Seoul was one market that was specifically asked in a question here. Is there any relationship with, you know, power and uh, accessibility and ability to work with the power companies and, you know, secondary markets moving up to you know, primary markets? Well, it certainly needs to be scalable. So local utilities are in many large cities are either ramping up or they have ramped up and they're now reconsidering. And we've talked about the Singapore situation quite a bit. Um, Jakarta, to my knowledge, ha none of the large operators have had issues securing power, though as more of them move in and build additional phases, it will probably get a bit more difficult. I think Seoul is generally mid-level difficult in general to build anything, let alone data centers as well. Um, and in terms of globally, we've seen certain markets start to run out of power. So this is out of region, but Amsterdam has done something similar to Singapore, where the power constraints were just getting too large. The concern over renewables were there. And so they also have a moratorium. Frankfurt is going to become more regulatory over the data center industry. And so I think a lot of this happened because while these markets were very pro data center to start with, the scalability happened too quickly and the utilities weren't able to keep up. So I think now that certain other markets are becoming more aware of that, in, especially across the uh, US and Europe, those are lessons to learn that if utilities are interested in playing the data center game, they have to be able to continuously add another couple hundred megawatts on an annual basis. And hopefully that's gonna be green power for sustainability. Great, um, thank you. Um, you know, we have another question related to, I know Hideaki, you had talked about rankings for Asia Pacific and kind of mention those top four markets. I remember, you know, last quarter when we came out with our data center, you know, global market comparison, it was exciting that two of the top 10 global markets with Sydney at number three and Singapore at number five came in in the top 10 global markets. Um, you know, projecting forward, um, you know, are those rankings for Asia Pacific pretty well set or, or, or is there an opportunity for some of these secondary markets, say, you know, next year or three years from now to kind of become, you know, one of those top five markets? And maybe Hideaki and Kevin, if you've got any thoughts around which secondary markets may or sure. may not have that ability. Sure, Tom. happy to answer that question. So. Um, Kevin already touched and mentioned about Seoul market, so I'm going to throw another Korean city, <laughs> that's Busan. That's also an interesting destination. Busan is a southern, southern eastern part of Korea, and it is the second most popular city, and it's a port city. The port city has a locational advantage, and obviously being located by the coast, and as a submarine cable hub of the country. 
And in fact, it's already well connected to submarine cables. And we are also seeing some uh, activities such as Microsoft developing domestic uh, data center in Prusam in order to expand their data center cloud services. Um, another interesting place would be Guam. As I mentioned earlier, the island is increasing the increasing its importance as a regional submarine uh, cable hub. Again, Turbidite is getting into Guam for their first data center, and the island is playing as a sort of a connection point for the region. And it wouldn't be one of the largest data center markets, but still posing interesting theme for growth. Great. Any markets that stand out to you, Kevin? Well, I guess I'm, I'm thinking we covered a lot of ground tonight <laughs> but, uh, or this morning, but the a couple other markets that, uh, that have come to mind that we haven't talked about are secondary markets across Australia. Uh, Melbourne, Perth, uh, good connectivity in both those markets. Melbourne is usually the secondary stop for a lot of the data center operators after they, they move into Sydney. So those are a couple markets that are uh, have some green shoots around them. Auckland in New Zealand for the very first time is getting a look as a, at a data center market and a couple uh, cloud providers are moving in. And I think that's it's a smaller market, but that might grow into something at least secondary sized in coming years. And uh, yeah, all across Central Asia, I mean, that's that has a long way to go. and We haven't even begun construction there, so that's going to be probably five to ten years down the road. We'll start to see some growth there. Just a follow up question. We have a question on the Malaysia market. Um, you know, do we see growth in Malaysia? And if not, what are some of the challenges to the Malaysia market? I think growth comes in Malaysia as long as Singapore keeps the moratorium up. And as, as long as those workloads are going to be cheaper to move to Malaysia, I think this is going to be the, the issue for a lot of companies moving forward is this rationalization of their IT, so to speak. So once you move to the cloud and you're figuring out, well, what can our savings be? It can also be part of moving into that hybrid strategy we touched on at the beginning with a mix of cloud and colo. Well, what goes the step beyond that? Well, you're looking at where you can place your colo so it's your workloads are optimized where the things that have to be in a primary market are there. But if there's anything that can move to a secondary market at thus lower cost, then that could be an advantageous. And so the most sophisticated companies take a look at that and figure out how best to to maximize that those savings. And so when you talk about Jakarta and KL around Singapore, those could be markets for that over the long haul. And so I think that's that's a pretty good growth prospect there. Great, a related question. Um, when do we think the moratorium in Singapore may be lifted? Any um, whisperings <laughs> or thoughts around that? Maybe Hideaki or Kevin or? That's a very, very difficult question. Uh, that, that expectation is the moratorium will be lifted by uh, 2022 and the Ministry of Industry and Trade of Singapore uh, mentioned that they will have some uh, sort of plan towards the end of this year, but uh, it's a, again, it's too early to speculate. The, the industry is keenly waiting for that, that's for sure. <laughs> and so I think uh, I think that would be a very, a very good move for the data center industry if that that lifted a bit. And I, I think also too, eventually, if if some of these markets around the world maintain their moratorium, well, those workloads do eventually migrate. And so I think that's that's a word of warning that some of this stuff will eventually leave if if there's no expansion capability. Great. I think we have time for one more question. Um, how does the evolution of country specific regulations on data storage and privacy affect the attractiveness of the specific locations? Is this a major factor or is that not really a factor that uh, groups take into account? So I'm thinking in certain markets, it becomes a big factor. So we've started to see this in the last year, um, using an out of region example granted, but when the United Kingdom went through Brexit, that meant that data stored there was no longer within the European Union. And if you're doing work in the European Union, you have to be working with GDPR and just have some local data storage requirements. And so as a result, the co-location market in Dublin had a very good year. 
and as workloads migrated to remain in the European Union. And so as countries around the world are thinking about their own data localization requirements, we may start to see a growth in those countries if certain data sets have to remain there. Now that also means that those markets then become unattractive as regional hubs for serving several countries at once. And so I think it's a double-edged sword there. You might get certain data center requirements, but you'll be missing out on others. Great, thanks, Kevin. And with that, I apologize. I think we're out of time today. Um, I know we didn't get to all the questions, um, but I'd like to thank the presenters and all the attendees for their time today. Uh, I want everyone to know that the webinar has been recorded and we'll forward that along with the slides uh, and a recording of the webinar. Uh, and we'll answer the remaining questions that we weren't able to get to today and send that out to all attendees attendees today and it will also be uh, on our website that you can access there. Um, really appreciate your attendance. Hope you're able to uh, join some future webinars. Uh, I think one on India is one that was mentioned hopefully coming up soon. Uh, thanks and everyone have a great day.